Welcome to OutDrive, folks. I'm your host, Cliff Callis, and each week I'm bringing you actionable marketing insights you can apply to reach, connect with, and convert rural American consumers. OutDrive is powered by Callis, a full-service advertising agency with a focus on marketing rural America. Callis offers a wide range of integrated marketing services, including website development, search engine marketing, social media, video, and digital. We develop strategic and creative campaigns to build your brand and your business. And you can learn more about us at ecalis.com. Now join me in the front seat as we head out on the road to success. Let's go. Hey folks, welcome to OutDrive. We've got another great story to share with you today about life and work in rural America. And out here in the country, technology is driving the marketing engine just like it is everywhere else and in every other industry as well. As a marketing agency, it's imperative that we stay up to date with the latest tools and tips to help our clients take advantage of all the new opportunities that are coming at us at a rate really faster than ever. You know, as much as they might like to, most of our clients just don't have the time or the resources to keep up with all the new things that are happening. They depend on us for that, and we're committed to do just that. But that's not just a commitment solely to our clients. It's a commitment to ourselves to stay relevant and forward thinking in identifying, assessing, evaluating, implementing, and then reevaluating new technologies. It's one of the reasons we've been able to sustain and grow over the years. And one way we go through this vetting process is through our relationship with the Agency Management Institute. You've heard us talk about them before. AMI's mission in life is to make advertising agencies better. And in this specific example, they plan and bring our digital marketing managers, specialists, and strategists together to network, share, debate, and support each other and the new technologies that are out there. And that brings us to our guest today. Kyle Meek is the Digital Services Director for Callus, our advertising agency. And Kyle started with us almost 10 years ago as a web development intern and an honors graduate from the University of Central Missouri. Since then, Kyle's role has evolved and grown, and he now serves as a member of our leadership team, and he directs all of the creative and production work in the agency. He and Megan Lemus, one of our designers and web specialists, recently participated in an AMI-led digital summit in Denver, where the content was user-generated in every way. Stay with us now as Kyle and I discuss AI, Google advertising, social media, web development trends, big data, and more. Hopefully, you're going to hear some insights and ideas that you can put to work for your company. Welcome back to OutDrive, Kyle. Thank you for having me back on. I guess since I'm back on, I didn't mess up the first time around too bad and didn't say anything too silly, at least. Oh, yeah. You you did a great job the first I I would have you on all the time. You're a natural speaker. You're a smart guy. You know what's happening in marketing and advertising. And I always enjoy our conversations because I always learn something. And so I'm excited to learn something new today. I know in the agency, you guys did a presentation to the total team about to the summit and all your takeaways and put together, you know, an internal white paper that helped everybody get up to speed. And, you know, they can kind of use that as a guide going forward to develop ideas for our clients. And heck, I learned a lot from that presentation. And so I know our audience is going to learn a lot today. And we've got a lot to talk about. I mean, marketing technology is driving our industry, just like, as I said in the introduction, every industry. And there are so many new things, and it just seems like they just keep coming at us faster than ever. But let's start at the top. How'd you like the summit? Oh, it's a great time. I get to network with some peers, see some friends I haven't seen you know, for about a year usually. And everybody there is an expert, really. Some are, you know, a little newer to the industry, but bring fresh perspectives. Others have been doing this for me, like me, doing it for 10 years or more in some cases and bring great insights and really lets us all share ideas, challenges, and find new efficiencies and ways to approach problems we might not consider sitting in a vacuum. So it's, it's always a great time just to catch up and learn a bunch. I mean, you said, you know, we passed along white paper after that internal meeting, but I think I came back with 15 pages of notes. It's just crazy considering I've been there half a dozen times that I'm still coming back with so much information. It just shows how much the industry keeps on changing. 
Yeah, I agree. And that that does say a lot when you have so much content to bring back. It shows that you really got a lot out of it. And, you know, I, I love that that's one of the things that AMI provides to its certified agencies is that opportunity to get together with your peers at your level and, you know, above and beyond, but specialist expert content experts on digital and get to share all that. Just like, you know, our account executives get together and share and our principals get together and our CFOs get together. And it's just such a great way to to learn and to to share with others. Of course, our owner of AMI, Drew McClellan, moved from Des Moines to Denver last year. And so now they've pivoted their meetings away from Chicago, where they most of them used to be to Denver, which is a great, you know, central location. What'd you think of Denver? You know, that was the first time I'd ever been to Denver, been to Colorado quite a few times. And it has a nice downtown with a lot going on in it. There was concerts and sporting events that same weekend, kind of a cool little different types of businesses, interesting things that we got to kind of walk through and see why we're there. Nice little water walkway near the hotel. So I got up to go run on that. And that was nice, you know, kind of change from what we get to do around here where there's not any major creeks or anything or rivers like they have out there. So Denver was nice. You know, I also went to Rocky Mountain this summer in Estes Park. And, you know, I'd probably go back to Rocky Mountain first, but that's just probably more due to personal preferences and that that Rocky Mountain is just such a beautiful area and hiking and doing everything up there is just, you know, an ideal vacation for me and my family. Sure. Well, and being an outdoors person like you are and a proponent of rural America through and through, I could see why you know, the Rockies would, would fit you very well. Denver does has, does have a really forward thinking culture, I think. And so, you know, as I think about technology, I think it's a natural that the, the digital summit would be there. Talk a little bit about some of the agencies that were there, where they're from, size of the agencies, because most of them are a lot like us, right? Yeah, a lot of them are pretty similar to us. Most of them are full service agencies with some specialties and Digital, there are some specialists there as well that just focus on just, you know, programmatic advertising or something specific, but really they're pretty, pretty full service and offer the full spectrum of advertising services that we offer. And they're from all across the U.S. There's some that are from the Eastern coast. There's some from the West. There's some down South. There's some right in the Denver area there. So really all across the U.S. and sizes vary, but they're pretty similar to us. Some are a little bigger. Some are real small operations, but all of them have experts and specialists. And I'm just kind of, that's, you know, how we've seen it over the years that, you know, there might be an agency comes or goes depending on the specific meeting, but there's always great input from all the different agencies. Yeah. And I think that is an important point to make is that everybody contributes and it's what allow us allows us to stay at the forefront of what's happening in our industry so that we do remain uh, relevant. We don't get left behind we're uh, aware of the new tools and and best practices and technologies that are popping up and you know collectively we're vetting those and seeing okay well this one would work for us this one would work for this client this one would work for this for all of our clients ought to be doing this and then hopefully we do a good job of communicating those new opportunities to our clients so that they can take advantage of them so, you know, I know number one on your list coming back was AI, artificial intelligence. And of course, as an agency, we've been using AI for several years for a variety of reasons. And, you know, your perspective as a, as a digital marketing expert and my perspective as an agency owner are different, right? In, in some respects. And so, you know, I'm anxious for you to share your perspective on AI from more of a user's point of view and a strategist's point of view. So AI is getting a lot of buzz right now. There's a good reason for it. Tell us what those are. Yeah. So as you kind of alluded to, AI has been in our industry for a number of years now. And it's, you know, when it first started, it was kind of the quiet partner in the background, you know, it's a little efficiencies in the different platforms, you know, helping us bid and create ads and monitor ads more efficiently. You know, Google's had little bits of AI. It's been given out to everybody through their search experiences, predictive text, things like that for a number of years. But it's really keeps on taking off in the advertising industry. Specifically, you know, we see a lot of efficiencies with content this year that we've really been able to unlock that gives us ability to do things more efficiently, faster, and better 
that includes researching topics, finding ideas, doing some of that keyword and SEO research that can be time consuming, you know, having an AI partner to help you uncover ideas and whittle them down is a, a great boon. Another thing that AI does great is helps us create variations. Say we create an ad and we want to see, hey, is there a better way to slightly do this or better phrasing? We can partner up with the tool and it'll help us tell us, here's another five to 10 ways to say this. And we can use that, put it all together, vet this voice, vet the style, make sure it all fits and get the best possible ad and then get some testing options to use as well. It helps us repurpose content, say, you know, we produce a long form white paper. It'll help you break down into bite-sized chunks, emails, social posts. It helps you really just maximize efficiency of what you're putting in that content marketing. And lastly, you know, like it's been doing for a number of years, it helps you proof grammar and style. And it can do some pretty good things with helping you add a, a bit of fl flavor or a, a specific voice to things, uh, although it still needs to be vetted pretty closely. Yeah. You know, it's, it's interesting to me because I think people that don't work in AI with AI in a marketing agency makes the assumption that AI can do everything that we do. And, and they're, they're kind of like, well, you're using AI for all your copywriting. No, you're, you're using AI to create images. No, uh, are we? Yeah, we're using it to make it better, but there is a lot of concern in our industry and, and, you know, as it relates to copyright infringement, as it relates to loss of, of voice, loss of brand voice. And, you know, the, the great thing about, you know, machine learning and technology is it allows our people to be even better at their jobs and to do an even better job for our clients. And so I think that's the really cool thing. You know, I, I'm not a forecaster. I don't know where AI is going to end up down the road. Um, but you know, for now it's a great tool that our people are using to make what we do better. Is that a good way to say that? No, I think that's the right way to look at it. You know, AI is really still a tool. I attended a webinar probably a year and a half ago now, honestly, when they were talking about using AI for content marketing and improving, you know, your content efforts. And the, the thing they said that I thought was really interesting was that maybe content marketing will change into content engineering because you're still going to have to have that content expert. And you also need to have the expertise on how to prompt the, how to get the right output and know what to put into it to get that right output. So, you know, the, the term they used was content engineer. And I thought that was interesting because it really is looking at it a different way. And you really do have to be a specialist, an engineer, or somebody that has that knowledge and you know, here's the data I need to put in. Here's what I can get out. Here's how I can refine that further to really get a best, the best output and even with all that said, you still have to have that experience and expertise to understand the overriding strategy. You know, AI a lot of time works in a vacuum. If you don't know that larger strategy, it's not going to know to work towards it. It's going to be that human intervention to guarantee that accuracy, make sure the sound strategy for the larger marketing plans in place. And sometimes, you know, AI is getting better at this, but the correct emotion can be missed. So, you know, you might be trying to make an emotional appeal with this advertising or this piece of content. And it just misses that. So you have to really vet that as well to make sure that it's accurate strategy is still sound for everything else you're doing and the emotions there. So definitely one of the tools that are going to take us well into the future, right? Oh yeah. It's just going to keep on growing. I'm sure in how every industry uses it. And I don't think marketing is going to be any different. We're going to keep on using it and using it to become more efficient and improve everything we do. And if I recall, you've got another summit coming up just for AI, right? Yeah, we're going to be attending another summit for with MyCon, Marketing Artificial Intelligence Conference is what they do as a kind of the bread and butter. They have a very large conference they do yearly. And now they have a specialty one just for agencies to talk about, you know, how we can use it most efficiently for our clients, interesting use cases for it. And then it's also getting to the other point you talk about is you have to be careful with copyright infringement, privacy infractions, things like that. And it's going to talk about how we can use it responsibly because that's another key component of using AI. Yeah. It can be a great tool, but you want to make sure you're only feeding it data that's safe to be fed into it. You want to make sure you're not using it somebody else's images and creating a new image from that, but still breaching the copyright on that original image or video. So there's a lot of little things you have to watch up with with using AI to make sure that it's still being used responsibly and legally. Yeah, yeah. So I'm sure we'll be talking about AI and marketing for a long time. Let's move on. 
you know, I think Google is always on in the conversation at your summits, right? I mean, they are so important to clients' marketing programs in a variety of different ways. And, you know, you guys have all heard the story about, you know, when we were first introduced to Google and how it changed our world at, at Callison Associates. Talk about what's going on with Google updates today. Yeah. So I guess the first thing I'd like to mention when we're talking about Google is that you know, although AI has shifted the landscape of searching and how people use things, Google's still still the monster in the room. It's still got the market share that's massive for almost every website we analyze. You know, 85, 95% of traffic still coming from Google. It's coming from a search engine. So it's still a behemoth from the search side, and it's still a behemoth from the advertising side. Google Ads has got a lot of new offerings. It's still got its bread and butter offerings, and it just keeps on growing and delivering on both the paid and organic side of uh, marketing. So let's talk just a little bit specifically about the things that we use Google for, for our clients. So we, Google is an integral part of all of our SEO campaigns. We're still optimizing for it, still making sure we appear there. It's an integral part of local SEO, making sure we're on Google business profile, that those listings are accurate and send people to correct locations, get them listed in the right spots. And then we use it very prominently for advertising. Google lets you run highly targeted ads across their full inventory, which is really quite wide and extensive. That includes search advertising. So appearing, you know, as text-based ads when people are searching for things and looking for services it includes YouTube. We can appear on video advertising. That's both on the apps, on the website, and one thing that a lot of people don't think about is YouTube's most often viewed on a TV these days. So that's really another form of OTT or TV advertising as well. We use it for display advertising. So the banner ads that pop up on other websites that are targeted based on your interests, your location, really a variety of factors to get the right person. And they have their shopping options these days. You know, Google Shopping is a another massive offering they have that allows people you to pop up while people are shopping actively or looking for products within a certain category or type. So very, very important component of everybody's marketing uh, program, or at least it, it should be uh, pretty much fundamental. It's kind of like a website. So there's a lot to learn with Google. And I know that the whole search engine marketing practice is an ever evolving uh, process in and of itself. And part of that is just from new technologies that emerge. Part of it is from Google changing up things to make it better. Because if I understand it right, Google's main interest is to try to make the search for somebody who is searching as fast and efficient as possible. And so there's a lot that goes into understanding how Google works and what it can do for people. And I know that at our agency, we're committed to be a Google partner, which not every agency is, but what does that mean? And what does that mean to our clients? So as you said, we're a Google partner. There are some levels and some things you have to go through to get that, that partner status. You know, it means we're showed expertise in the platform. We've completed certification showing that we've gone through and learned all the best practices and we have experience in platform through spend and efficient usage. So you really have to show expertise and efficient usage in the platform. So we go through that and do these certifications every year, which means, you know, you, it's not a get it once and forget about it. It's a, it's a constant renewal process. Cause like you said, Google does change the platform changes and they want to make sure you're appraised of all their updates so you can use the platform efficiently. So we go through that every year and keep that partner status. And you no, know, not, not all agencies are that, and probably the majority aren't, but a lot of our AMI agencies are. So it's nice to go there and talk to the AMI agencies and learn from other partners and other experts, how they're using the platform as well, because it just broadens our, our knowledge base and further. So, you know, we go through everything Google asks us, and then we get to meet with other experts that go through the same processes and use it a little differently than we might, but still use it very efficiently. And we get to kind of take and integrate some of their ideas as well. When I think it's so beneficial that Google not only offers training for subject matter experts, to become even better. But, you know, we send all of our employees through their, what I would call basic training, you know, so somebody that's going to be working with a client that may not actually be doing the SEO or the SEM or buying ads, but they understand what they do, why they're there and how they're used. 
so that they can help a client better understand how to use them as well. So I think that's really a, really a positive thing. You know, one of the, one of the, I think, questions that many people have in their minds is how the, the organic search and the paid search work. And many people don't understand the difference or how you get to maximize the opportunity that you have with Google by either going down the organic side or going down the paid side and how ultimately they work best together. Why don't you explain sort of how that works? Yeah. So as you said, SEO, the organic unpaid, this is where, you know, you're really optimizing your content and website to appear works best when you pair it with a pay-per-click or a Google ads program or a Bing ads program where you're also boosting your search results. So where you appear on the search engine with a paid component or an advertising component, when you really pair those as a cohesive plan, it works best because both tactics support each other. And as you kind of mentioned earlier, Google really, and other search engines want the best user experience in the end. So how do they get the best user experience is getting accurate ads that helps send people to your website when appropriate. So you're targeting the right people with the right landing page, the right keywords, it's on your website. And then it's also through providing relevant content to Google that shows expertise, authority, and trust, and then getting people to come to your website from those organic listings. So when you pair them together, you know, you can build, use pay-per-click to help where your SEO might be a little lacking. So say you don't have content developed that's been established with Google as the best piece of content there, or you haven't had time to develop that content. You can use a paid program to help fill in for those gaps on your organic plan and help you appear, you know, in the short term, still get those wins on those important keywords for your business. So say, you know, you've got a brand new product that you just released. You want people to find it when people are searching, but Google doesn't really know much about your product yet, hasn't had time to learn that it's a great product. So you use that paid side to help boost it there, get it there temporarily, have people start finding it, have people learn about it. And then over time, you build out your organic presence. So then people will continue finding that product, continue finding information about it. So that's kind of how they can work together. And the other keynote is that SEO and the paid side both rely on relevancy very strongly. Google loves relevant content, loves relevant websites, loves strong user experiences, because as you said, they want to give the best user experience to everybody. So make sure they have a relevant landing page for both SEO and pay-per-click is very important as well. Yeah. You know, there are times that we have potential clients come to us and say, you know, I just don't feel like my search marketing is working as well as it could be and should be. What can you do for us? So take somebody through the process of if they came to us with that business objective, that marketing objective, how would we approach that? Yeah. So I think the first thing we'd want to do is really just talk to them, learn, you know, where are you struggling? Where do you feel like you're not appearing? Get that kind of insight on, you know, their initial impressions. And then we want to really go into an audit process, go into the analytics, go into the data, really look into it, say, okay, are these assumptions validated by the data? Is there other areas where we might be lacking and we think we should be stronger? Really do an audit of all the different aspects of a website's SEO, do all the different aspects of how they're appearing on Google. If they already have a pay-per-click campaign, really look at that and the performance of that where there's missed opportunities, where is best practices being missed. So, if, you know, go through that initial conversation, then go through a bigger audit process. And then after that, what we'd really recommend is probably starting out with a, a hybrid program where you start out with a pay-per-click campaign to help get you those quick wins so you can keep on supporting yourself. And then introducing a long-term SEO program where you have some content generation, long-term optimizations. SEO campaigns being built out, you're being supported by the paid campaign. And then slowly over time, as your SEO builds out, you can turn down that paid campaign a little bit and just rely on the long-term investment in SEO that takes a little longer to appear, but also lasts longer. And it doesn't need a constant high level investment. You know, you still have to monitor it. You still have to look for new opportunities. You have to monitor changes in the search algorithm and adjust based on that. But you know, that that initial SEO efforts do last and help you long term without having to do it at the same level sometimes. So and then it can also reduce some of the advertising you have to do. So there might be a higher initial investment, but then it kind of lasts longer. Right. It, and, it, and you used a great word there. It is an investment. It's an investment in building the brand, building the awareness, and then hopefully driving sales through generating high quality leads. Talk just a minute before we move on about the reporting that we do for clients. 
Yeah. So for any client we have an advertising or search campaign with, we wanted to do regular reporting. We get in there every two weeks, if not more frequently ourselves to make sure everything's functioning exactly as we expect to make sure there's no issues. There's nothing going on. That's a fluctuation that's unexpected. And then once a month, we'll get in there and do a bit deeper of a dive and provide updates on KPIs or the key performance indicators to see, you know, what's, is this driving the goal we wanted to? And if it's not, how can we make it drive the goal? And if it is driving the goal, how can we improve it further? Because we don't want to stagnate. We want to keep on improving. And then quarterly, we do a deeper dive into opportunities. So maybe things we're not looking at right now, but we could look at and try and find a deeper dive into opportunities, deeper dive into performance and see how we can improve. And then if not by campaign, every three to six months, we want to do a really deep dive once a year and go into the full strategy of everything and support all that with the data. And in between all those touch points, we also provide a real-time dashboard so people can look at their performance as needed. And they can always reach out to us and ask this question, say, hey, you know, I checked the dashboard. I see there's this fluctuation. Is there any reason why? Should we be concerned? And we're, we're more than happy to answer those questions. We, you know, we love it when a client's engaged in their data and their marketing plan. Yeah. Okay. So we've talked about AI. We've talked about Google. What's next? One more thing maybe to mention before we move on, even from Google Ads, is there was a couple new offerings that Google's rolled out recently that's kind of interesting and ties back into the AI topic too, as a performance max campaign. What it kind of replaces the old school Google shopping campaigns and what it really is great at and why I want to mention it is it can extend reach and maximize resources for somebody. So if you need to roll out an advertising campaign and you want to reach somebody across all of Google's different assets, you know, YouTube, display, shopping, search, that can be a great uh, tool to do that without having to create a ton of ads for all those different platforms because it uses Google's AI systems to help optimize bidding, budget, audiences, creative to really extend your reach and maximize conversions for the lowest investment. So, you know, maybe you don't have all those ads already created. Maybe we don't have, you don't have all the resources to create those ads at the moment. This can get you started up and running and still get you a great reach and drive conversions like sales specifically for in an efficient way. So that's, that's one quick one. I kind of want to highlight that's a little newer before we moved on from Google ads, just because I think it's something that could be beneficial to anybody who's trying to maximize reach and drive conversions. Yeah, I'm glad you threw that in there. So I guess that, uh, you know, when you guys talk digital, social media always has to be a part of that conversation. And, you know, ironically, just yesterday, I was reading an article that sort of mentioned or implied and backed up with some data that social media usage might be waning a little bit. What's your what's your take on that? Yeah, you shared that article with me and it was it was very interesting. And I think it does kind of reflect the modern role of social media and you know how people use it it's it's kind of trending a little bit more traditional media with fewer interactions but people are still consuming content still looking at things still on there still seeing the businesses and the brands they trust still getting the news they trust so they're on there and they're they're engaging but they might not be comedy in as much they might not be as as social which is kind of funny to think about because you know social media they're a little less social and they're a little bit more treated as a content feed or a consumption. So that's kind of an interesting change, but also one that we we probably have been seeing for a little while. And it's just a it's just a little bit of a change of perspective on how you have to view it. Yeah. Which is scary when you think about the power of social media. But I get that. But doesn't that make it harder to gauge the effectiveness when people aren't maybe engaging as often? Because now you're just getting you're getting views, not engagement. Right? Am I looking at that right? Yeah, it, it can certainly make reporting a little more challenging. You might have to look at, you know, what your social media program's driving, what what the objectives are. And if you're trying to drive that engagement, you might have to try and tweak your strategy a little bit to keep on engaging people, you know. Use different types of content, make sure it's videos asking questions, make sure it's things that are really driving those interactions. So that's what you still want to look for. But I think, you know, you can also just look at social media from a slightly different viewpoint, you know, as we kind of alluded to that, it that it's a little bit less of a, an ongoing discussion all the time, but sometimes it can be treated more of a, as just a critical part of your awareness efforts, building your brand, building considerations, appearing in front of customers and prospects and really building the trust and getting them to, getting them to know you. So maybe it's changing your strategy a little bit if you want it to be that engagement driving machine, or it's looking at it a little differently and going, Hey, it's. It might not be driving as many clicks to your website anymore. 
and might not be getting as many comments, but you're still doing that critical aspect of brand building, awareness building, getting people to consider and trust you a lot more. So it still has a very critical and important role. You just have to look at it a little differently or tweak your strategy. Yeah. Well, and strategy is such an important word, you know, not only in social media, but in every component of a marketing plan. And, you know, to me, just in kind of watching what's happening on social media, there doesn't always look like there's a strategy behind what's being done. And sometimes I question whether there really is. I know in our agency, strategy is at the core of everything that we do. What kind of social media strategies would a business have for itself? Yeah, so there's a lot of different ways you can look at strategy. And the strategy is ultimately going to be what's the business goal you're trying to achieve. But probably the one strategy we tell everybody to consider if they're not already is, you know, kind of going back to how it's changed, it's not driving to those traffic and conversions as much organically. So we would say, you know, supplement that organic campaign with a targeted, specific advertising program to help you achieve those goals you might be missing. So adding on, it, and it doesn't have to be a massive budget. It doesn't have to be something that's a huge resource investment. It just has to be a little bit to boost that engagement, to drive that traffic, to get that product out there and help drive the sales. Because, you know, social media has lost some of its ability to do that without playing that role with critical strategic advertising. So how do you respond to the statement that somebody says, well, nobody's looking at Facebook anymore? You know, social media usage trends do change. And, you know, probably some people that used to look at Facebook don't look at Facebook. But in general, Facebook still is got a lot of massive market share. Instagram's got a massive market share. And, you know, if you advertise on Facebook, you're really advertising on Instagram as well. You're getting the meta ads manager and you're running your things through meta's tools and getting the reach across all their platforms. But, you know, usage does change, but it, it's still massive and it's, it's still being used. And there's a, a lot of research out there showing that although it might be changing, it's still very prevalent. You know, we, we discussed this in our in our meetings internally that, you know, much of what we can, much of what we do, others can do too. But why would somebody consider using an outsource for social media? Somebody like us. Yeah. So we put out an article pretty recently that really drives into this, but kind of highlights some of the big benefits of it is, you know, the big, the biggest thing, why you want to get an agency like us is to regain time and resources. You know, it, it does, it might not take a ton of expertise to get those posts out there sometimes, but it does take a lot of time and resources to stay on top of it, keep creating content, keep creating fresh content. Another reason to work at working with an agency on a program like this is, you know, everybody in the agency here is experts on their specific niche and their specific field. So, you know, by engaging an agency, you get at, access to all these different experts in design and digital strategy and advertising strategy and content strategy changes with the algorithm. You know, you get to access all this different information and expertise. That's very difficult to follow. You know, that's one of the reasons why we go to these summits is because it is a lot of information and there's a lot of trends and things change. So, you know, it's hard to stay on top of that and keep that expertise. So that's one other reason is, you know, that's, that's what we're doing. That's what we're here for is to keep that level of expertise you can also get better engagement and visibility with consistent posting. So one struggle of a lot of business owners is, you know, sometimes we'll have extra moments, leaner times where, you know, they're not having to do as many other business related tasks where they can put all that effort into that posting and keep it going. But then when business gets busy, one of the first things that are lost a lot of times is that consistent social media presence. And that can hurt you because, you know, people expect to see you there. And when you get good quality engagement, you're going to get boosted up next time. So you want to keep consistent posting. And that's something that an agency can help you do is we can put that focus on it for you. We're going to elevate quality and creativity with our expertise. We're going to always be on there monitoring with our tools and manually for brand safety and online reputation. That's another thing that's critical if you have a presence on social media is that you're not just posting and forgetting about it. You want to make sure you're staying on there, responding to questions, concerns addressing negative topics that can appear and then really capturing and maximizing positive interactions. So if somebody talks about how great your, their experience was or how great your brand is, get on there, boost it, talk about it, engage them. So you want to get ahead of those brand safety concerns. And then you really want to maximize things that can help boost your online reputation as well. Going back to, you know, what we talked about a moment ago, one strategy that's also key is integrating advertising into the plan to increase reach and engagement and conversions. So 
working with an agency, you get experts in digital media buying that can help you with that component. That can be quite a bit more tricky than just the basic posting. And lastly, you know, we talked about it with a lot of other things. It's important to monitor those KPIs and have a cohesive strategy and optimize towards it. And that's something that we do all the time and have a lot of expertise in it as well. Yeah. You know, one of the other, I guess, sometimes it's a question, sometimes it's a statement, but it's kind of like, as it relates to web development, and of course, that's that's sort of your origins. You came to us initially as a as a web development intern, and and then have just grown your role over the years. But you're you still direct the development of all of our websites. But it's somebody that says, "Oh, you know, I can I can build my own website. You know, why would I use an agency for a website?" So why don't you speak to that just a minute to get the web conversation going and then talk about some of the new things that you're seeing from your perspective. Yeah. So it, it is true. You know, anybody could go out and go to Square or some of these other types of programs and say, Hey, you know, I want to build a, a website and they could get a website up and launched and they, they can do it pretty quickly these days. But the difference is that you lack, you know, that overarching strategy, you lack some of the coding best practices. You miss some of the SEO strategy and work behind the scenes, you miss some of the performance optimizations. And I think the most important thing that is lost whenever you go through an approach like that is uh, a lot of times user experience isn't really considered, you know, what's what's the objective of this website? What's it meant to do? Who's the audience? How do we get these people to come to this website and achieve a, a business objective? You know, it takes a lot of planning and a lot of strategy to go from an idea of here's a here's a goal we want and then get it achieved through a website. And it takes a lot of expertise and experience to know you, we need to restructure this navigation to drive this a goal. We need to make sure this call to action here is to drive this goal. And without going through, you know, a planning process, a discovery, user experience process, you're going to miss a lot of those things. And your website's just not going to work for you as well. So, you know, although you might be able to get that website for quite a bit cheaper, you're, it's just not going to drive goals as efficiently and not going to really work as a, a business tool as efficiently either. Yeah, that's and a good. A, another downside of locking into, you know, those smaller platforms is that you you are kind of locked into those platforms. So say, hey, I need a, a bit of functionality that this platform can't support. Unfortunately, now your website's locked in there and you can't add that chunk on anymore. So you lose a lot of flexibility. And when it comes time to introduce that new, feature, you might have to rebuild your website, unfortunately, because you, everything's trapped on that old platform. So you'll have to pull everything down manually, rebuild it all, and then build out that extra piece. So you might end up doing the, the full investment later on anyhow, just due to the nature of how they want to kind of keep you there. Yeah. I remember the client that came to us and you know they really needed a modern marketing program and they had spent some money with another vendor to to do a website that really couldn't grow with them and do what it needed to do from a marketing standpoint. And, and, you know, they're kind of in between a rock and a hard place because they had already invested all these dollars, you know, to get to that point really felt kind of sorry for where, where they ended up. But you said it, you said it really well when you talked about the website working for you, because it's not just a brochure online. It's a tool. It's a marketing tool that people use to drive business. So talk now about what are some of the new things that you're seeing? Yeah, so we we talked about all the different ways people are building websites these days, talked about, you know, the the strategies we've been using for a couple of years now, and, you know, how can we optimize those? We talked about ways to build websites quickly for shorter term goals. But one of the most interesting topics we kind of dove into a little bit more than we had in the past was headless website development. It's kind of the new trendy term, a little bit like AI is across all marketing. And what headless really means, although it sounds kind of strange, is you're separating your content management or data from the side of the website that public users access. So you really have one system for just your content, your technology, your data, and one for the side that public users actually come to and work with. And why you want to do that really is it delivers great performance and security. So you're taking all that slow down of processing content, accessing data, running everything from that front side that people are going to. So they're getting really quick performance. And then having that separation there helps with security because they're not interacting with all that sensitive information directly. They're going through a whole nother layer and whole nother disconnect. So, you know, maybe they get into that public website. Well, that's really all it is, is public information. So you have some additional security benefits there. 
And the other really big benefit of using a headless approach is since everything is separated, your content and your data can be one hub to multiple platforms. It can power an app. It can power a couple websites. It can go to all these different sources and you can use that centralized hub to redistribute and repurpose content across the spectrum and really offer you greater flexibility than you can achieve any other way. And it also provides a lot of flexibility for your developers to provide ideal solutions based on the same content and information. So it's it's got a lot of benefits and it's it's a pretty cool way to approach web development that's really kind of taking off over the last year or two. So do you see a lot of developers using this approach? We think it'll have its place. You know, as much as, you know, it has all these different benefits, it is very developer heavy on the initial timeline. So, you know, kind of going back to what we talked about, you know, with all website development and, you know, you'd be able to build your own website, you know, the, the layers of complexity you add, you know, adds to your development time. So headless is a pretty complex solution and it requires a lot of custom brand new development. And that's what gets you all those great features and benefits. But that initial development is a lot more complicated. So it's probably close to a high level enterprise type solution, but it certainly have its place. And a lot of big brands and businesses are already implementing solutions that are headless in nature. Yeah. So I think, you know, what I heard there and uh, what I've always believed and is that, you know, a simple website is a simple website. And then when you start adding features and functionality and content, then you mentioned the time goes up and of course time is money. So that means the budget goes up. And yeah. so, you know, it's really, I, I hate to use the word nearly impossible, but it's challenging to price a website without going through the discovery process because you don't really know how it's going to work, what you're going to need, what what you're trying to achieve, what technology is going to be used to achieve it. And you could end up with a very simple website or you can end up with a very complex. And there's a pretty broad range in time and money between those two. Did I, did I say that right? Yeah, I think you're looking at and talking about it in just the right way. You know, you, we have to go through a, a discovery and scoping process and understand the business objectives, the features, the types of content, the functionality, everything that needs to be included to really understand how we want to build it in the first place. You know, maybe we can use one tool. Maybe we should use a different tool. You know, maybe we get in and we talk about, you know, what you really want to achieve and it's a headless approach and that's a whole nother, you know, can of worms to open, but a whole nother set of benefits. The analogy I like to use, and I'm sure... People who listen to the podcast have probably heard me say it, is that looking at a website's like a lot like looking at a car. You know, you can go out and buy a used, beat up junker car for a few hundred dollars to a few thousand dollars. And, you know, it might get you here and there and it might be fairly reliable for a little while. But usually when you buy that old, beat up car, it's going to have problems after a while. Or you can go buy yourself a budget friendly, brand new car that will be a lot more reliable and last a lot longer but it's still going to be a little limited or you can go out and buy yourself, you know, a Ford F-150 Raptor that's going to take you everywhere off-road, do all these different things, look cool, you know, have all the performance benefits and all these specialized abilities, but you're going to spend the money on the Raptor or you can spend the money on the luxury car. You know, there's, there's a lot of ways to look at it and there's all these different levels and just kind of like a car, there's all these different price points. And sometimes the price points can be pretty similar for a website and a car, you know, the entry can be pretty low and the high end can be pretty high. And the other important thing that I like about that analogy is that just like a, a car, a website needs maintenance and it needs to be looked at, needs to be checked on. You know, you don't buy a brand new car or even a used car and never change the oil, never check the tire pressure, never rotate the tires. If you do that, the car's not going to last very long time. And the same reason you don't want to build a website and never look at it from a technology standpoint, a security standpoint. You know, you have to get in there and make sure that everything's updated, that the website's stable, the website's secure. And then, you know, every once in a while you want to look at it and go, hey, is the website still achieving all your goals? Do we need to get a performance modification to it? Do we need to get a brand new set of tires because now you're off-roading more? You know, things like that. You know, you can look at it from all these different ways is, you know, you have to do routine maintenance on it. You have to keep it healthy or it's not going to serve you very long. And you have to look at it every two to three years to see, is it still serving me for what I need? Or maybe I need to look at getting a different website or maybe I need not driving in the city anymore. I need to get a truck to drive off-road or to handle the snow, you know, it's kind of like life, you know, you have to look at it and make sure it's still serving you every once in a while and not just build it and forget about it. Cause that's not what you want to do. Yeah. That's a great analogy. I, I had forgotten about that one, but that's, that's excellent. I guess uh, the other big topic that we ought to talk about 
because it, it's just always right there is data. And, you know, there are some agencies that are employing data scientists just to, you know, slice and dice the data and help clients uh, understand how to use it. And certainly we do data science as a part of uh, several jobs in our agency just to understand data and how to use it. But what's new with, with data, first party data, et cetera? Yeah. So I guess the first thing to mention as we talk about data is, you know, it's, it's not a new change or new challenge, but privacy laws, regulations, the way technology is built and used all keeps on getting more restrictive on, you know, the amount of data that us as marketers and website owners can collect and use. So, you know, you want to be aware of that and make sure you're using data responsibly and that you're collecting the right types of data. But, you know, with that out of the way, you know, we exchange a lot of good ideas. And the main thing that you really want to focus on, and, you know, we've kind of been talking about this for a little while now is you want to collect that first party data. You want to make sure you're getting information into your CRM, your systems, and you want to collect that and process and utilize it because it's key to for success now and in the future. Um, because, you know, maybe we'll lose this target option, this ad platform that we use for years. Uh, maybe that's how you're accessing a brand new target and a brand new customer base frequently. You might lose that ability with some of these restrictions that are being introduced. So you want to make sure you have that first party data in your in-house and in your access and responsibly owned so that you can then make those direct communications. You can use that data, to create lookalike audiences to maybe target other potential customers whenever that targeting option you were using is gone. And it also lets you really just uncover new insights about your audiences and users so you can reach and approach them and engage them in different and interesting ways that you can't do without collecting that first party data. Yeah, but it is a challenge. I mean, everybody has so much data that they collect and you really have to make the commitment to want to be on top of that. But, you know, the, the beauty of it is it's your data, right? Nobody else has access to that data. It's your data and you can use it in so many ways to help you grow your business. Well, let's see. We've talked about a lot. We've covered a lot in a short amount of time. What else? What other kind of closing remarks should we talk about, Kyle? No, I think we talked about most of the interesting topics that kind of popped up during Digital Summit that I wanted to share. But you know, I think if I just had you know share one overarching theme that you know people want to think about is that you know digital is an effective advertising method and it shouldn't be ignored, and it is changing a lot. So you have to you have to stay abreast of all these changes to continue to be efficient. So kind of like we were talking about website, don't just launch a program, launch a website, and forget about it. You know you want to launch that program and then look at it every so often, make sure it's still serving you. You still have a good strategy in place. Your tactics you're employing are still effective, that you're still on the right platforms. You know, platforms change where your audience goes changes. So really continue using digital marketing to be effective and then continue reviewing it because it's not something that can be treated as a static tool because it is very agile. So make sure you're looking at it, make sure it's still serving you well. So you're not missing out on opportunities that could be very valuable to your business. Very well said. And now me, Mr. Salesman, jumps in and says, and if the folks at Callus can help you with any of those things, please do not hesitate to reach out to us. Hey, Kyle, I appreciate you being with us today. That was very interesting. I'm sure very insightful for our audience. I appreciate you uh, taking time out of your busy schedule to be with us. No problem. I appreciate you having me on. We'll do it again. Folks, thanks for listening to OutDrive. I hope you've enjoyed our visit today with Kyle Meek, Digital Services Director for Callus. Come back again next week and I'll take you down the roads of rural America where it's heaven on earth. Thanks for taking a ride with us on OutDrive. This episode is complete, so head on over to eCallus.com for more insight. You can apply to help drive your business growth. And be sure to sign up for our free monthly e-letter, OutThink, for even more helpful content about marketing to rural America. Have a great day and keep on driving. Thank you.